there's going to be a lot of patients where we don't know exactly what's causing it. And there we have to have biomarkers to say, well, here's four things that I know are active in this person. So neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, cytoskeletal abnormality. So these four things we can detect by biomarkers. We need drugs to attack those four pathways. And I think mm. that's going to be the way that we're doing cocktail, cocktail treatments in the next few years. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to Episode 6 of Connecting ALS. I'm your host, Mike Stevenson, from the Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota chapter of the ALS Association. This month, we were very fortunate to secure some time with arguably the most influential ALS specialist in the world, Dr. Richard Bedlack of Duke University. As always, Dr. Bedlack has a number of irons in the fire, and we chatted about ALS Untangled, his ongoing study of ALS reversals, and where he sees research heading in the near future. For our second segment, I sat down with Jennifer Jelly, the executive director at our chapter of the ALS Association, to discuss some of the recent feedback she's received from individuals and families impacted by ALS while on a three-state listening tour. Before we get started, I want to thank a couple of our amazing sponsors for supporting the ALS community and our upcoming gala event. Dell EMC has been a tremendous partner in the fight against ALS, so we want to give them a shout out. Dell EMC, reshaping the industry through IT transformation, combining leading infrastructure, data storage, hybrid cloud, and data protection solutions. And I also want to thank our friends at CH Robinson, who are also having a massive impact on this cause. C.H. Robinson solves logistics problems for companies across the globe and across industries, from the simple to the most complex. Okay, let's get rolling with our phone conversation with Dr. Richard Bedlack. We are delighted to be joined on the phone this morning by the one and only Dr. Richard Bedlack of Duke University. Good morning, doctor. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, good morning. Uh, I feel a little bit silly introducing you further because I think anyone with even the slightest connection to ALS knows who you are and celebrates your work. But uh, I do feel compelled to verify that you are the Dr. Richard Bedlack, um, <laughs> award-winning professor of neurology and director of the heralded Duke ALS Clinic, the person responsible for ALS Untangled, the ALS Reversal Studies. You've been named American Academy of Neurology's Patient Advocate of the Year, the Rasmussen ALS Patient Advocate of the Year, America's Best Doctor. What uh, what am I missing? Well, Mike, uh, all that stuff is nice, but I will not consider myself a success until I find the cure for ALS. So that's uh. what's missing. Sure, sure. That's the that's the one trophy that you are chasing. You probably had to add a wing onto your office just to house all of these accolades. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. Well, we're we're so excited to be talking to you. And right off the bat, I want to get into two of the more substantial areas of your work: ALS Untangled and the ongoing study of ALS reversals. With ALS Untangled, which for our listeners who maybe aren't familiar, is essentially a social network where people living with ALS, scientists, researchers, and clinicians essentially combine knowledge and source information to review alternative and off-label treatments. It's been around for about 10 years now, is that right? That's correct. What, what's new in the ALS Untangled world, Dr. Bedlack, what has changed? Well, you know, uh, it's, it seems like there's more and more of these alternative and off-label therapies out there. So uh, this is all sort of new to me. I mean, as of 15 years ago, I had no idea that patients were so interested in these things, nor that there were so many of them. Mm. And, you know, I spent the first few years of my of my career just sort of building an evidence-based a way to take care of patients with ALS. You know, Duke had no infrastructure for that before. And so I traveled around, talked to some of the experts that were out there doing it and uh, built, you know, a multidisciplinary ALS clinic and spent all my time doing that. and was sort of proud of myself that I was able to, you know, build this infrastructure to give folks lots of mainstream options. And then I realized it wasn't enough. I realized that patients were still coming to clinic with large 
bags full of supplements that they were purchasing on the internet. And, wow. you know, when I asked around, I, it didn't seem like anybody really was paying much attention to this. It seemed like the attitude in the field back then was either ignore it or uh, just, you know, tell patients that this is a bad idea, that this is a bunch of garbage. And neither one of those seemed right to me because obviously if, if so many patients are interested in these things, we need to be interested in them too. And the reality is, you know, we didn't have the answer. We still don't have the answer. And so I think it's perfectly reasonable that patients would, you know, seek an answer outside of mainstream medicine. And so I wanted to, to be part of that and to figure out how to work with them on that. And unfortunately, there was no template in any field that I could find. I still don't know of any field that has an organized way to help patients and families better understand these alternative and off-label treatments. Yeah, I, there's certainly nothing that I've seen. And can you talk a little bit about the infrastructure for a second? I mean, is do you have a team that you work with that sort of maintains the site and makes changes as necessary? Are there people in the ALS community that are helping with that? How does that really work? Yeah, so I mean, there's three parts to it. The first is, you know, where we get our ideas. The second is uh, how we actually do these reviews. And the third is how we get the information back to the patients and families that asked about it in the first place. And so, we tried to make it as easy as possible for folks around the world to get their ideas to us. So you know my email address is in several places on the internet. But we also have a Twitter account and we get a lot of ideas through Twitter. Mm. Nice thing there is people don't have to remember, you know, anyone's specific email address, just one key word. In this right. case the word is ALS Untangled and so when people send their ideas to me through email or Twitter, I move them over to our website to something called the open reviews section of the website. And that's, you know, that's a list of all the things we haven't reviewed yet. And if you've been on that part of the website anytime recently, you see that it's exploded. It's, it's yeah. you can't even fit it on a slide anymore. It's well over 400 things yeah, that people wild. have asked us about. And so we try to figure out a way to prioritize things. We give, gave people the option of voting. They can just click the vote button next to the topic of their choice. But we also realized that some of the things near the top of the list just didn't have a lot of useful disclosable information. And so we had to come up with a way to multiply the votes by something to help us prioritize these in a more reasonable way. And so the, the multiplier that we came up with was zero, one, or two. Zero if there's just nothing to write about. We can't find out anything about it. Uh, and one if we can find just a little bit about it, even just how it's supposed to work. And two is if there's actually a published trial, because that's where we get the most information about, you know, mechanisms, about how this performs in people, both from an efficacy and safety standpoint. Sure. And then there's the reviews themselves. You asked about a team. Yes, thank goodness. I have a team. It's um, about 120 clinicians and scientists now from across 11 different countries that are working on this wow. program together. So I'm really proud of the, of the multinational uh, flavor for this. Yeah, that's great. And we had to kind of invent a way to do it. Like I said, there was no template we could use. And so over the years, it's evolved. We eventually came up with something which we call the table of evidence. And that is kind of like, uh, that's the structure upon which all of our reviews are based. And, and basically what that means is we've got five categories that we care about for each review. One is mechanistic plausibility. That is like, what is this supposed to do? And is that even plausible with what we know about the laws of physics and biology? Mm. Number two is like preclinical. Has this ever been given to any sort of uh, ALS model, a cell model, a, an animal model? If so, what happened? Number three is case reports, like what are people who tried this actually saying? How many of them? Can we actually find these people and prove that they really had ALS? And if they're saying that they got better, can we prove that from any clinic notes? Sure. Next is trials, and that's the one we wish we had more of, but there's just not that many trials of, of AOTs. And then finally, risks, like if you tried this, what are some of the bad things that could happen and how likely are those? And in each of these categories, we assign a, a grade like you used to get in school, ranging from A to F. You okay. want A's, you don't want F's. And there's very specific, what we think are pretty objective cutoffs for moving to better letter grades. So like if we were just look at, look at the cases, you'd get a D if all we could find were some people you know, on Facebook and in chat rooms saying, yeah, I tried this and it made me better. You get a C if we could actually find one of those people and get their records and prove that they really had ALS and that something objective was really improving while they were taking this product. Mm. You get a B if we can find multiple people like that and you get an A if there's multiple people like that that are published in a peer reviewed journal. So that's the, that's the basic idea for how we do the reviews. And then 
How we get the information back? Well, once we have a draft of a review, we crowdsource it across our whole team. Everybody has about two weeks to send in their comments and their suggested edits. We get a, another version that we all agree with, and that gets submitted to a medical journal, which is called ALS and Frontal Temporal Degeneration. And then the editor of that uh, journal, Dr. Orla Hardiman, over in Ireland, makes one last review. Mm. And if she agrees with it, it gets published. And we've got an agreement with the journal that all of these articles are published through something called free open access. That's so important because, you know, a lot of times patients and families, if they wanted to read the medical literature, they'd have to pay. A lot of articles right. are 50 70 $100 to download. Yep. So making all these free was key. And we also published those articles on the completed review section of our website. So if you go there, you can see that there's 50 reviews. Click on the name of any one of those reviews and it'll open up the whole article. Or you can just see a summary on that page of what we gave it for grades across the five categories. And then last but not least, uh, as you know, Mike, we're doing podcasts. Your podcasts yep. seem to be a way that a lot of people like to get their info in 2019. Mm -hmm. And so um, we partnered with a group called Create which is an NIH rare disease clinical research uh, consortium housed at the University of Miami. And uh, they are setting up an infrastructure for us to record podcasts around each one of our reviews. And the way that works is we actually have a, what we call a research ambassador. This is either a patient or a, a caregiver who wanted to learn more about research and attended one of our clinical research learning institutes. Mm. They, are, they are the interviewer, and their job is to solicit questions from the patient community and then to distill those questions down into a five to ten minute interview with me. So they ask me those questions that the community has, and I answer them, and that's, that's a different way of sort of learning about each one of these topics. Yeah, it's very, very cool. Uh, the podcast is great. I've been listening back to some of the episodes, and it's, a, as you said, a unique way to get at some of these questions that the ALS community has. And it's just a, it's another layer to that ALS untangled model uh, and one that it seems to be as efficient as ever with all these things that you're adding. And I should mention that you can find all this info at ALSUntangled.com or on Twitter, as Dr. Bedlack mentioned. Are there plans in the near future to adjust or alter the format in any way? Or is it a situation where you're continuing to get strong data, the model's working as it is, so it's, it's best to maintain the current structure? Well, I, I really think we do need to make some improvements. So um, there's, a, there's a few things that we're working on. One, you know, the website itself, I'm, I'm not a web designer. I have no special training in that. I basically, you know, worked with a friend of a friend uh, to build this thing, and I never mm -hmm. dreamed it would go on this long or become this big. Right. And, you know, clearly I think the website could be more user-friendly. I've heard from several patients that are newly diagnosed, you know, that they get on there and it's kind of like, well, where do, we, where do we even start? There's so much stuff here. Sure. So I'm trying to work with some people who have experience in web design to make this look less intimidating, to make it easier to use. I want it to be something that people can easily use on their smartphones. And like right now, we, we never really built that into the design of the oh, website. Right. It doesn't look very good on a smartphone. The way that we actually uploaded our published reviews apparently is not easily found through a Google search. So like if you were interested in antifungals for ALS, there might be a lot of things that come up before the ALS Untangled article. And again, this is, this is something that is outside my understanding of how the internet works, but web designers understand this and there's a certain way that those reviews have to be re-uploaded so that they're more readily, readily found by a Google search. They should be one of the first things that comes up oh, when sure. somebody's searching for that kind of stuff. And then, I've just had a lot of people in other countries that are interested in the same things. And so we're trying to work with different groups to get at least a podcast translated into other languages and hopefully eventually all the content from the website. But right now we've got a group over in Italy that's starting to translate the podcast. And I've been emailed about a group from Spain that may be interested as well. So nice. I love to see these, you know, translated into other languages. Yeah, that's an excellent idea, and uh, we appreciate the uh, peek behind the curtain of ALS Untangled. It's always interesting to hear straight from the source on that, and it's something that folks uh, connected to the ALS Association here in our region ask about quite often, and we say, well, we know Dr. Bedlock and, um, and his amazing work, and we encourage them to check out the website and also the podcast, because he said it's 2019, everybody's got to have a podcast, and, and uh, it's a great way to get the info out there. I'm sure you're asked about ALS reversals 
all the time, everywhere you go. And you can understand the way that those very words can carry such weight. The idea that someone could develop ALS and then by some set of circumstances uh, we don't yet grasp, get better and actually see their symptoms reverse. Naturally, people are going to be curious about that. And I've heard you uh, before very thoughtfully put context around those investigations and that research. But uh, since I know that you and others have been chasing these answers for a while now, is there anything uh, new or definitive there that you've gleaned from the investigation to say, okay, here's something that these individuals uh, who saw their ALS reverse do have in common? Well, I wish I could say I know exactly what's happening with these folks, but I still don't know for sure. So mm -hmm. as you probably know, I found my first ALS reversal around 2011 as, as part of an ALS Untangled review. Mm -hmm. We were asked to look at the website of an energy healer. And on that website, there was a recorded video, uh, which turns out to have come from an old uh, Fox TV show from the 1990s about, you know, mis mysteries and supernatural mm -hmm. stuff. And I thought, there's just no way when I saw that video, I said, this, this cannot be real. And uh, we've got sort of an algorithm for finding folks and whose names appear on the internet. And we found this person and sure enough, I talked to her on the phone and she sent me her records and I was blown away. I mean, I was absolutely convinced from those records that this person had ALS, that she had progressed to severe disability, probably near death. Mm. And then, you know, over the course of a couple of years had gradually recovered what appeared to be completely. I mean, it seemed that she was able to run and throw snowballs and stack firewood, just absolutely amazing. And mm. I had always been taught, and the textbooks still say that ALS is always progressive, always disabling, always life shortening. Now, we know that people can progress at different rates, of course, but I had never heard of anything like this. And so, first thing I did, like I always do, is I reached out to some of my more senior colleagues who, you know, at that time had seen a lot more ALS than I had. And mm -hmm. amazingly, almost all the senior people that I talked to said, you know, I have seen one or two people that I thought had ALS that got better. Mm. And I said, well, what happened to them? They said, well, when they got better, we just said, no point in you coming back to clinic anymore. I was like, right. Oh my goodness. I mean, we've got to, we've got to find all these people and get them all in the same database and study yeah. them every which way we can. Now there's a lot of possible explanations, Mike. I mean, if you talk to my more conservative colleagues, they all say that they don't believe these people ever had ALS, that they must mm. have had some ALS mimic. Uh -huh. Well, if that's true, I don't know what it was because from the charts, there was an extensive workup in all of these patients. And so I don't know what could have been missed. It must be something no one's ever heard of or described before. Right. The other, the other thing that's odd is, you know, about 10% of these uh, 43 now ALS reversals, so four of the 43, mm -hmm. have a positive family history of ALS. In fact, you know, one of them has like multiple generations of ALS. So mm. it would be an awful strange coincidence that somebody with a family history of ALS who had what appeared to be ALS and then got better actually had something completely different that wasn't ALS at all. That's an awfully yeah. strange coincidence. So as you know, we've got a couple of programs underway and hopefully, um, you know, with the STAR program, hopefully uh, in the next six months or so, we'll have some genetic data that we can share. The uh, samples on most of the patients have now been collected and sent to our colleagues at the CREATE Consortium. Mm -hmm. They're being analyzed at the University of Miami and at St. Jude. And uh, we're, do, we're looking at whole genome sequencing in these folks and comparing it to, you know, a thousand other patients that are in the, in the CREATE and University of Miami database who have more typically progressive ALS. And so mm -hmm. that's what I'm actually keeping my fingers crossed about is that if there's an ALS reversal gene, you know, like there is for HIV elite controllers, man, that yeah. might just quickly accelerate us toward an understanding of, of the ALS biology and, and ALS recovery that we've never had before. It's a long right. shot, admittedly, but I mean, that would be, that would be the absolute greatest thing if I could find an ALS reversal gene and quickly find out what it did and manipulate that in everybody and maybe make reversals happen more often. Yeah. But there's, there's a lot of other things cooking. I mean, we've got uh, preliminary data back on our environmental questionnaires. So we took the National ALS Registry with their permission, of course, used their risk factor module questions 
and asked them to the ALS reversals and compared the answers to everybody who's in the National Registry who has more typically progressive ALS. And interestingly, there was a, well, there was one thing that came out to be different, and that was the longest job held. So the ALS reversals were much more likely to have been woodworkers for most of their mm-hmm. lives compared to people with more typically progressive ALS. Now, I don't know what that means. It's yeah. like completely out of the blue. I never expected that right. to be a difference. But maybe there's something that immunizes the body. There's some chemical in wood that somehow immunizes people against ALS, like a flu shot immunizes us, immunizes us against getting a severe case of the flu. Mm-hmm. Maybe like prolonged exposure to terpenes, which are in wood or formaldehyde, which is in wood. Maybe that somehow immunizes us against ALS. Wow. It's certainly a testable theory. We can make an, an animal model and we can figure out how to expose it to those kinds of chemicals and see if what that does to change maybe the onset or the progression of the animal's disease. So right. these are some of the things that we're thinking about with that data. And then we've also got um, some interesting things coming up for 2020. We're going to be doing a microbiome study. That's a really hot topic now. And I mm-hmm. know this, you know, how, how that family of uh, organisms, vi- bacteria and viruses that live in our GI tract, how that influences the progression of ALS. And there's really some amazing data that's come out in the past year. There's a paper in, uh, in Nature where they actually manipulated the microbiome of the SOD1 um, mouse model. And depending on which bacteria they put into the gut, they could dramatically slow or speed up the progression of ALS. Mm. And so, I mean, what if what if these reversals somehow have a completely different microbiome than people with more typically progressive ALS? Maybe that explains how they're able to fight the disease off. Yeah. And then, last but not least, we're um, we're hoping to start enrolling in a uh, an autopsy program. So. You know, if someday some of these ALS reversals pass on from old age, we would love Mm -hmm. to be able to get them into a tissue bank because I would expect, you know, if they really had ALS, there ought to be at least some histological evidence. I mean, that that's our strongest way to diagnose ALS. There's certain findings in the brain and spinal cord, for example, certain inclusions that are seen in motor neurons that, Mm. you know, are pathognomonic for ALS. And so I would expect that these reversals would still have some of that pathology evident in their brain and spinal cord. And right. so that would be another way to argue against, you know, this being a mimicker. And so is that something when you meet with someone for the first time, maybe they're recently diagnosed or seeing you for the first time, do you get that ALS reversals question uh, early on? Do people come ready with that question? I do. I get a lot of questions. I think that's part of, I have a little bit of a selection bias, I think, in my clinic. I think people Mm -hmm. travel here because they want to hear about alternative therapies and ALS reversals and things like that. But I'll tell you, you know, the things that I've learned in these programs, including the fact that ALS reversals can sometimes happen, they've really changed the way that I talk to patients. I mean, Mm -hmm. I've always stressed the variability in ALS progression, but now I even tell people, look, I cannot know for sure what's going to happen to you in the next three, six, 12, a hundred months. Mm-hmm. What, what my strategy is um, to try to make you the best person that you can be today with my multidisciplinary team. And, you know, we, we might have a hint about some of the things that might happen in the next few months and try to prepare for those. But with this natural history of ALS being so different from person to person, and even these extraordinary cases of people who got better, I think I don't think it's a, a good idea for us to think out too far because we just don't know for sure what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you alluded to it, your, your clinic's reputation at Duke and more specifically your reputation, it means that people from all over the globe are interested in your medical opinion and care, whether it be on the diagnostic side or care recommendations, et cetera. Is there a lot of intricate scheduling and planning that has to go on at your clinic because maybe one day you have someone flying in from Europe or Asia or Central America, and then you have to balance that with folks there uh, in Durham and elsewhere in North Carolina? Yes. I am very, <laughs> I am very blessed to have an incredible staff here, starting with my, uh, my clinic coordinator, Stacy Aznani, who I call Wonder Woman. I've never mm-hmm. met a more talented person in my life than Stacy. I don't know how she does it, but mm-hmm. you know, when, when I forward her an email or, you know, a phone message and just say, you know, we've got to try to get this person scheduled. 
she makes it happen. And I know there's a lot of people involved. You know, there's an international patient office that has to be involved, yep. which I know frustrates some folks. But the reality is, you know, when you're coming over from another country, I mean, Duke University has to, there's certain things that they have to be sure about, including they have to be sure that you understand that Duke is going to have some costs. Mm-hmm. And there's got to be some agreement in, in place ahead of time that those costs are going to be covered in some way. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot more complicated than I ever realized, but thankfully I have a lot of smart people around me that can handle those details and I can focus on taking great care of patients with ALS and doing research. Sure, sure. I want to ask you about clinical trial protocols as well. There's been a lot of conversation recently uh, around the value of placebo control, et cetera. And, and we recently spoke with Dr. Nathan Staff uh, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester about the emergence of platform trials in ALS research. In your opinion, because you're so entrenched in this universe, doctor, how much is going to change about just the general way we conduct ALS research in the next few years? I think a lot. So starting with what we call ALS, right? Because right now, today, you know, end of September 2019, Most ALS trials are still lumping it all together, and that's clearly wrong. You know, clearly there's a lot of ALS subsets, and the trials that are focusing on specific subsets where we can identify either the cause or the primary molecular driver of progression are going to be the ones that have the greatest effect on the disease, in my opinion. So Mm -hmm. I think the antisense trials where they're only enrolling people with, you know, disease caused by SOD1 or c 9 orf 72 mutations have a chance of actually being cures for those subsets of the disease in the next couple of years. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this is, this is not surprising. I mean, this is how folks in cancer have made such strides. Nobody goes to the doctor in 2019 and comes home with a diagnosis of cancer. Right. You, know, you come home with, you know, you have small cell lung cancer and it's, it's locally metastatic, but not widely metastatic. And, you know, based upon those details, there's a specific cocktail of drugs and surgery and radiation that you get Mm -hmm. and not everybody with cancer gets the same thing Mm -hmm. and that's the way we're going to be doing we're going to be doing trials in the next few years i think we'll be looking at subsets of patients i also think this whole idea about doing platform trials is coming at just the right time you know as we're learning so much about als we have so many companies interested in testing things we've got to find a way to be more efficient Mm -hmm. and you know this business of um each time that you want to do a trial, you know, rebuilding the whole infrastructure, the contracts with the people that are involved and the FDA um, IND application and the IRB application, it's, it's yeah. maddening. I mean, mm-hmm. I've been trying for over a year now, about 14 months, to get a trial of curcumin off the ground. And mm-hmm. the reason is because there's five ALS reversals associated with this, but there's also a lot of there's a lot more background that you can read about in the ALS Untangled on curcumin as to why I'm excited about it. But okay. I mean, for goodness sake, curcumin is a spice you can buy right now on Amazon.com or in any right. grocery store. And it's, it's a year and I'm it's 14 months and I'm still not open because wow. it just takes so darn long to get all this stuff done. And that's very frustrating. So having an infrastructure already built <clears throat> where you can just add things in quickly makes tons of sense. And I think this will be, those are the two things I think will be will be true of all trials in the next few years. We'll be focusing on subsets and we'll be using a platform. And uh, there may be more than one platform. You know, the NEOS mm-hmm. platform trial is going to be the first one, but there may wind up being other platforms. So I think uh, that that's going to be really exciting. That seems to be con- the consensus that we are truly on the cusp of, of real change in ALS research and that there are promising things happening. You mentioned the word cocktail. Is is that what you foresee as the future of treatment for ALS is a combination of drugs that are going to help people with different forms of the disease? Well, I think we're going to have to come at it from one of two directions. We're either going to have to really know what we're doing in terms of subsets, or we're going to have to attack multiple mechanisms at the same time. So mm. I think an antisense drug for people with SOD1, you don't need a cocktail. I mean, that could take care of the problem right there, that one drug, because you know exactly what's causing it. But on the other hand, there's going to be a lot of patients where we don't know exactly what's causing it. And there we have to have biomarkers to say, well, here's four things that I know are active in this person. So neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, 
cytoskeletal abnormality. So these four things we can detect by biomarkers. We need drugs to attack those four pathways. And I think mm. that's going to be the way that we're doing cocktail, cocktail treatments in the next few years right. with biomarkers helping us. I realize we're focusing a lot on research, but I want to ask about your advocacy work as well, Dr. Bedlack, because you somehow find the time to be an extremely active voice in the ALS community, speaking out on a number of issues, uh, as well as lending your expertise and influence to raise awareness about the disease. I could argue, and a lot of people do, that what you're doing in that space is just as important as your work in the lab and the clinic. When was it that you made the decision that advocacy and awareness, those pieces were going to be something that you pursued with passion? Well, I think that was also very early in my career. That was never something that was taught to me, like so many of these other things, you know, the the uh, widespread interest in alternative therapies, the fact that ALS reversals can happen. I never really was taught or knew anything about the importance of advocacy. And I think mm-hmm. it was it was fairly early in my career when I started to see that there were people with ALS that were putting themselves out there as far as, you know, going to members of Congress and changing laws and, you know, people that were out there holding fundraisers. And as a result of those fundraisers, very innovative outside the box research was being done that never would have been funded through any kind of mainstream grant program. And so I just became incredibly um, impressed with the power of, of advocacy and wanted to become involved. And what I would say about my efforts to, to be involved is I'm trying to empower patients to be more inf- effective advocates. I mean, whatever, whatever I can do on my own, that's great. But if I can empower an army of patients and family members with ALS to be more effective, that's going to be so much more than I could ever do on my own. And mm-hmm. so I'm really excited about these clinical research learning institutes that, that we started uh, in 2011 and that have started to, you know, now grow and are being held, you know, at various places around the United States and hopefully soon around the world. But we've held 15 of these programs where we take people who are very interested and have the raw materials to be great research ambassadors. And we bring them in for a weekend where we have sort of a curriculum faculty present slide decks about different aspects of research. But Really, that's meant to sort of be a starting point for a discussion. And Mm -hmm. um, we actually, we faculty learn as much or probably even more from the patients and families who attend than they learn from us. Like, for example, one of the first uh, clinical research learning institutes we had, we learned about how frustrating it is for patients to try to use some of the tools that are out there to find a research study they can participate in. And I had no idea. Um, I thought clinicaltrials.gov was great. But it right. turns out if you're not like super computer savvy, it's terrible. Yeah, and it's so tricky. We, yeah, so we created it within the Northeast ALS Consortium, what we think is an easier search engine, but also we created a person whose phone number and email address is on their website. To me, that's kind of like a clinical trials concierge. Mm-hmm. You're stuck, just call this person and they'll work with you on the phone or by email to try to find something in your area that you can participate in. But yeah, I mean, the, the people who've graduated, the 320 research ambassadors who've graduated from this program, we uh, constantly, every month, get together with them. So we've got something called the Peace Committee, which is part of the Northeast ALS Consortium. Mm -hmm. And we have a teleconference. And anybody who's interested, any clinician or uh, researcher from Niels, uh, can get on the phone with this this whole panel of research ambassadors. And uh, different folks who want to present a project can come on. So IMALS was recently on there presenting something that they needed help from the ambassadors. Sure. In the past, there was a company, Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma of America, got on there and said, hey, mm-hmm. we're starting this biomarker study. We'd love to have some patients involved in the design of it. So, I mean, this is, this is what I think is sort of my role in advocacy is to empower patients to have a bigger seat at the table and then continue to find ways to take all the stakeholders in research and put them in front of these these patients and, and make sure that they understand the patient perspective on everything that they're doing. A patient once right. said to me, nothing about us should ever be done without us. And I'm, I'm trying to make sure that that comes true. That's a, that's a fantastic philosophy. And it is 
encouraging to see that the ALS community has had a stronger voice, particularly in the last few years, and that people are feeling more in control over their care and what's possible on the research side and access to trials, as you mentioned. And those are all things that we're going to need if we are going to move forward towards meaningful treatments and a cure. I I'm exhausted just talking about all the things that you're working on, Dr. Bedlock. I can't imagine how you find enough hours in the day, but really thank you for all that insight into what's happening in your world. And on a less serious note before we let you go, because uh, we know how valuable your time is, I don't want to keep you much longer, but tell me about your recent Texas Hold'em activity. I know you're a good-natured card player. Are you planning another World Series of Poker Run in the future? <laughs> uh, probably not, Mike. Um, I, I, do, I do love, uh, you know, all the different things that, all the different directions that my ALS work has taken me, believe sure. it or not. I've always been a card player. I've loved Texas Hold'em, but I got to the World Series of Poker because I participated in an ALS fundraiser. And, you know, my whole point of going there was to support my patient who was doing it and to say a few words about, you know, the research that we were doing to get people excited and right. hopefully make them want to donate. But I sat down at the table expecting to be there for no more than an hour. And 13 hours later, I was the only one with <laughs> chips. And I was going to <laughs> the first prize was a seat at the World Series of Poker. So that's how that all came about. But it's amazing the directions that life takes you. It's really incredible. Yeah. Yeah, well, and and just the the experiences you've had with people all over the world, and the and the folks you met, and the stories you could tell, we'll have to have you back on at some point in the next year just to tell some of those stories. I think because I, I know that our audience would enjoy uh, hearing those. Oh, I've um, met some of the most amazing, most inspirational people, and you know that's why I, sometimes people say, you know, family members, friends, they say, how do you do this, like? You work so hard at this and all your patients, well, most of your patients anyway, keep getting worse in spite of your best efforts. And I just say, I don't look at it that way. Like I keep finding new opportunities for them, new ways to fight the disease. And at the same time, I'm working with like the most amazing inspirational people you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, patients, families, coworkers, colleagues, I mean, who wouldn't want to work with all these brilliant, creative people? It's, it's just a blast. Yeah, and, and I know that's a lot of what motivates staff here at the ALS Association is is meeting those inspirational folks and hearing their stories and, and wanting to work hard on their behalf. That's a lot of what drives us all. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Richard Bedlock. We so appreciate all of your thoughts on these subjects. And like I said, hopefully we can have you on again soon to go even deeper. But in the meantime, thank you for everything that you do for the ALS community. Well, thank you, Mike. And thank, thanks to the ALS Association uh, for being such great partners in all this work. Awesome. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. If you're anything like me, you could listen to Dr. Bedlack talk all things ALS for hours. But he was extremely gracious to give us the time he did to answer our questions, and hopefully we can bring him back on the pod sometime in the near future. All right, as I mentioned at the top, our second interview this month is with the executive director at the ALS Association's Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota chapter, Jennifer Jelly. Jen is a visionary leader and also my boss, so it was a fun opportunity to interview her for this segment. We are joined today by Jennifer Jelly, the Executive Director for the Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota chapter of the ALS Association, which is, of course, where we produce Connecting ALS. Jen, thanks for joining us today. I'm so happy to be here. For the sake of our listeners, could you give us a little bit about your background and how you ended up here at the ALS Association? Of course. Well, I am a Minnesota native, grew up in the southern part of the state in Mankato, And after college, I had a short stint in the corporate world, and it didn't take me long to realize that I needed to work for a mission. Mm -hmm. And that started my now 20-year career in the nonprofit space. I spent time at both the MS Society and community health charities before joining the chapter seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, I didn't know anybody living with ALS, but I had uh, allegiance to the neuro space, and I can't think of a better place to have an impact than this organization. Well, and you've made a lot of positive impact during your time here, and it wasn't that long after you uh, came on to the ALS Association that the movement known as the Ice Bucket Challenge occurred. It must have been a pretty exciting wave to be a part of. 
it was thrilling. I mean, we didn't know what was happening. And to watch that unfold and to see where the tipping point might come and it grew and it grew and it grew and to watch the ALS community experience having the spotlight put on them and having the world pay attention Mm. to a disease that always tends to get forgotten was really exciting. Mm -hmm. And not only it gave our office a lot of hope, it gave the entire ALS community hope. And that is something we've been really able to utilize as we figure out how to stop this disease. And we're five years beyond the Ice Bucket Challenge now. We've, we've spoken about that a few times on the podcast, being here in 2019 and thinking about everything that has occurred since then. In uh, your opinion, as someone who oversees this organization and helps guide the care and support that it provides, what's the biggest difference between 2014 and now in terms of what the ALS Association Uh, has to offer those living with ALS? The number one thing we did from the start was get rid of all the waiting lists that we had. We had people that were waiting for pieces of equipment from our loan pool and from our communication program. Mm. And we weren't able to always get everybody what they needed immediately. We had to wait for somebody else to be done with that before we could then loan it out to another family. And with that influx of funds, we were able to purchase everything that people were waiting for and get that to them, which, as you can imagine, people don't have time to wait. This is not a disease of waiting. So to be able to do that was really exciting. And I think more importantly, the fact that we haven't had a waiting list since Mm. is really how our organization has shifted. We're no longer trying to fight the list. Uh, We're able to get people what they need when they need it and as quick as we possibly can. I think the other big game changer since 2014 is technology. You know, how that has shifted our work and expanded our programming since then is huge. And I see that continuing. You know, we now are offering our smart home program where we're able to set families up with smart home technology so that they can control their environment and do things on their own that maybe they couldn't have before this technology existed. Mm -hmm. It not only brings independence to that person living with the disease, but it decreases the burden on the caregiver. And those are two things that we're very interested in. And I think technology will continue to be the game changer and how we're able to help people live independently, how we're able to help the whole family deal with this disease in their home as long as possible. We have spoken a lot about technology on Connecting ALS and some of the things that this chapter and the great organization have been able to do have helped make, uh, for lack of a better word, connections uh, between Mm -hmm. our services and the ALS community. Is that something that you make a conscious effort to think about when this technology continues to evolve? And how do we find new ways to access our services and offer those to people that are living in our three states, a lot of times in rural communities in greater South Dakota and North Dakota and Minnesota as well? Absolutely. I mean, you just said it perfectly. You know, our three states Our geography is a challenge for Mm -hmm. us. We have a lot of land in Minnesota and North Dakota and South Dakota. And getting to folks where they are can sometimes be difficult. But with technology and what we've infused in our new office and here in the connectivity center that you and I are sitting in is the ability to be able to connect with both individuals and caregivers no matter where they might be, whether that's through video conferencing, whether that's through doing a number of different videos and demonstrations so that when somebody might need something, they can have access to it. Hmm. Often what we would hear from people is, cool, you guys are open from nine to five and I can call you and find out the information I'm looking for, but I often need it at 2.30 in the morning or when I have a free moment. So to be able to have videos and different pieces that are available on our website or on social media, in fact, this podcast, Mm. people can access it in a way that works for them and at a time that works for them. And I see that continuing to evolve and us being able to produce more with the space that we have so that we can connect with people no matter what. Meeting individuals where they are at. Exactly. And that's something many nonprofits are striving for and service organizations are striving for. And it means something different now than it did 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So to be able to offer those things in the way that this chapter and other chapters of the association are pretty meaningful for families living with ALS. 
One of the main reasons I wanted to talk to you today, Jen, is related to the ongoing listening tour that you have embarked upon over the past few months, Mm -hmm. traveling around the three states. We mentioned, of course, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota. You're meeting with people impacted by ALS, those living with, their families, caregivers, friends. Uh, What's been the goal of those meetings? So the goal of the listening tour is well, it's kind of in the name, is mm-hmm. obviously to to listen. We want to know what people are thinking, what they're going through. I want to, I would love to hear from people on what's working for them, on what the chapter is offering, and what more we can be doing. What are their biggest needs? Where mm-hmm. are they frustrated? How can we play a role in that? What that might look like? And to your point, every community is different. What I'm hearing in Bismarck is not the same of what I have heard in Mankato. So being able to be in that space with them and find out what's important to people really helps us decide as a chapter, what more can we do and how do we need to shift and evolve based on what the community is telling us? Right. So you're meeting with individuals and families who have been impacted. I imagine in addition to getting an update from you on what the chapter has going on and them giving you feedback, which we'll get into in a moment, I imagine it's also an opportunity for those folks to connect uh, with one another and kind of uh, share their experience and swap stories and and tips about how they're living. A hundred percent. And I think that has been one of the most exciting outcomes so far of the listening tour is, you know, just at the last one that we did in North Dakota, we had two families that were there that both had been just newly diagnosed. Mm. And the number one thing that they were looking for was connection. And they got it immediately that night. And being able to connect with somebody else that was going through the same thing was really impactful for them. And that has been kind of an ongoing theme that I have heard so far on this tour is people just want to know where other people are. They want to connect. They want to be in community with people that understand what they're going through without having to explain anything. And what they learn from each other is also really critical. They can tell each other things that they hear differently Mm. coming from another family versus maybe somebody on our chapter staff. And that's really impactful. In fact, that's led us to start exploring how we can help continue to facilitate those connections. So we're looking into some potentially new programming where we can connect families together in meaningful ways so they have additional levels of support in the ALS community. And I'm really excited about that. That's great. And another benefit of, of holding events like this listening tour, which ne- that wasn't necessarily the primary goal, but is certainly something people will find if they exactly. attend. Exactly. Exactly. And before I forget, you have a couple more dates coming up in the month of October, right? Yes. In October, we're doing St. Cloud, Saint Cloud. and Sioux Falls. Yep. And I think St. Cloud's October 17th. That sounds and correct. And Sioux Falls is the 30th. So yes. be sure to check our show notes and social media for further information on those dates if you are in St. Cloud, Minnesota, or Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Jen, more broadly, what kind of feedback are you receiving from folks who are attending uh, these listening tour meetings? Uh, is it about what they're hoping to see from the ALS Association or just kind of general ALS care and support, or is it both? It's all of the above. I mean, I think the people really want to know what all we're doing. I think the overwhelming piece of feedback I have received is we just want all the information. People are hungry for information. And it's been interesting to think about then how we deliver that information, because we've had quite a few that have said, I know that I somebody probably told all of this information to me, maybe in my first clinic visit. Mm -hmm. But that first clinic visit is such, I'm in a haze of, I don't even know what's happening. So how do we continue to deliver that information in a meaningful way that they hear it? So it's been really beneficial to folks, I think, just to get an overview of what the chapter is doing, what's available to them and their families, and how how we do that for them. People have learned quite a bit. We've also heard that the programs that we're offering are great. People really appreciate, they especially appreciate the equipment and Mm -hmm. the turnaround that we have and the fact that they don't have to wait for things. And they also really want just more information on research, how they get involved. And again, they want to know who else is in their area, Mm. who else they can connect with. It almost becomes just its own little, support group isn't the right word, but social gathering. Mm. And so 
it's been interesting to think about how we continue to facilitate that and and how we can create opportunities for people just to be social with each other. It yeah. doesn't have to be any any set agenda or any set topic, but how they can just hang out. Yeah, and that's again something that's been addressed before on connecting ALS. This disease uh, can be so isolating. And many exactly. times people uh, that are living with ALS and their families feel like uh, they can be cut off from the greater community and even from their friends in some cases. And anytime they have a chance to relate and share that experience with someone, that's they usually want that. So mm-hmm. holding these sort of events, I think it will continue to be key. I want to ask you, there's this rallying cry on social media for Many different groups with an interest in disease research and care. It's nothing about us without us, which uh, essentially says we need to have more input in how we're cared for and the resources available to us and research that takes place. I think that's a valuable message for not just the ALS Association, but a number of disease-related organizations out there. And the more we solicit feedback and seek out this kind of input, the better care and research guidance we'll be able to provide. Getting any of that kind of vibe from folks that you're meeting out there? A little bit, and I and but I think that is a hundred percent correct. I mean, I I think it would half the reason we're doing the listening tour is to help shape how we're serving folks. Mm-hmm. And if we're not asking them what they need, how would we even know what to do? And things shift over time. I mean, we talked about technology earlier that's shifting what people need and what we're able to provide. And so listening to folks on what's important to them, I think should absolutely shape the types of programs and services that we offer and the type of care setting. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we're doing here locally is a telehealth pilot. And a lot of this came from individuals that we serve talking about the challenges getting to clinic at certain points in their disease progression. So how can we help facilitate moving the telehealth access forward so people don't have to worry about that as much? I think that's a great thing. Uh, One of the examples of how people have told us, this is what we need. Please help us do it. Yeah. Someone is going to be listening to this podcast and saying, uh, I want to attend one of these events and they're going to find out it was already in their community yeah. or maybe it didn't come to their community. Yeah. We don't want them to feel like they can't uh, offer this kind of feedback or ask these sort of questions at any time. What are some of the ways that the ALS Association gathers input from the people we serve? Are there things throughout the year? Can they uh, reach out to us, call us, email us? What's the best way to get in touch? Well, all of those things. I mean, I think there's, depending on what your comfort level is, there's different ways that you can submit your feedback. You could do it at support group setting if you're in a place where you attend support group regularly. You know, we do do a survey on an annual basis Mm. to people living with ALS and their caregivers. That's a great opportunity to do that. If you attend a ALS clinic where we have a team member there, you can certainly give that feedback to them. Or frankly, you can just call or email me. I'll talk to you anytime. Mm -hmm. I love that. I just had a family reach out just a couple months ago to offer some suggestions on information we could provide on our website. And it was a great suggestion and we did it the next day. It was really helpful to hear from folks on, hey, I learned this. Other people should know about this. So I would welcome anybody to call or email us, whatever works well for you in terms of communication. That's key. And, and Jen's, she's not lying. She does not mind hearing <laughs> from the people that we serve. And really anyone who has a question about ALS, don't hesitate uh, to call or email at any time. Again, you can find our contact information on our website at alsmn.org. Or if you follow us on social media, we list that information there as well. Well, thank you so much for your input on this important topic, Jen. I know there are some exciting initiatives coming down the pipeline uh, here at our chapter, as well as the Greater ALS Association, and we know how to find you when it's time to discuss, so it's probably the first of many appearances for you. I look forward to that. Thanks so much for having me. That's going to wrap up Episode 6 of Connecting ALS. Remember to track us down wherever you get your podcasts, and you can visit ConnectingALS.org to subscribe on your favorite service. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for all of the latest podcast news and updates and bonus content as it becomes available. For November, we'll be highlighting National Family Caregivers Month with a couple of special segments, so we hope you come back for that. Connecting ALS is produced by Garrett Tiedemann from the headquarters of the ALS Association's Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota chapter in St. Paul, Minnesota. 
Thank you so much for listening. You'll hear from us again soon. 